Okay, wonderful. You're on time. Thank you very much because actually the pause was until now, but if I had told you it's 25, probably um, we would be very late. Welcome. So welcome back. We, have our own thing. we had this fantastic morning with the three experts introducing us into the policy framework condition from the global scale to the European scale. And Helga had already some very good ideas. How do we use them? How do we manage? And what do we need to see that the policies that exist, the programs that are there, that they are implemented in the best way for our forests? And I do not repeat, you see on, the, on top on the screen, the beautiful photos that have been taken. They are not photoshopped. They look like this in real, as you can see, our experts. But there's one new expert, uh, he's smiling, so he was photoshopped. That's Franz Thoma, <laughs> a dear colleague from Bavaria in Germany. Bavaria is the same size like Austria. I say this is quite important. Uh, the population is around a bit more than 10 million. It's the number one driving economy in Germany also, and very important for the forest-based sector in Germany. It's Hesse, where I grew up, Bavaria, and um, Thuringia, and Baden-Württemberg to some extent. And Franz's background is he's working today at the Bavarian State Enterprise. In 2005, the state of Bavaria changed a part of its uh, forest organization into the legal form of a state-owned enterprise to be more flexible and efficient as an actor in the market. Because with the administration burden and administration time-consuming processes, they found out that it will probably be never get to the point that the forest-based sector in Bavaria can play a larger role. Franz Thoma is within the organization, and thank God to all the things you have done in your career already, has been heavily involved in European policy making, um, several expert groups. He was uh, working with the C um, CPF, the Confederation of Private Forest Owners in Brussels, for more than two years. He had been working in many other expert groups and providing the, his knowledge. He was in Berlin dealing with German policy making, which is more complicated than Brussels. I can say that as a German. And um, the good thing is also Franz has the knowledge of the practical work in the ground because he was working in forest offices in Bavaria and still has this knowledge. So the round table also, please, if you have questions, just raise your hands and Edurne is helping me also. You can raise it in any, any language you speak, that's fine. They are all multilingual or we translate them for you. My first question, Franz, can I start with you? You were listening to the great three experts this morning. What would you say works for you in your daily work? What you have heard, what is good? Where do you see problems? Is it too complicated? Is it sometimes not very clear what they have presented, what you need, for example, in your daily work uh, out of this knowledge? Yeah, thank you very much. I'm really uh, happy to be here today. So th thank you for being here, a part of this panel discussion. And I'm the first part of the value chain. So I think it's really important. We've heard uh, a lot of things, how work, how are the politics and policy working there on EU level, but also national level. But I was also impressed by the speech from the Vice Minister and also the video because there are really a lot of good messages in it. So I found a lot of similarities. And that, that's, for, that's uh, especially the message, we don't, have a so uh, we don't have a choice, we have to act. So it's not an option just to see what's happening and to leave the forests unmanaged. Because, therefore, we have uh, too much importance in all the sector. And if you just um, look there on the world population, for example, it's growing. When I was born, there were about four billions of people. Now we have eight, more than eight billions of people. So the need for raw materials is increasing, of <coughs> course. And we are living in a cultural landscape. So this is the basis for our doing our daily businesses. 
and also to provide the, the raw material wood then to all the others of the value chain. So this is a really important thing and we are doing this there then practically on the ground and we having a lot of challenges. And then of course it's important how we can manage our forests and therefore we have the the EU level and the politicians are giving us the framework and it's not getting easier as just uh, Helga showed this kind of puzzle of EU policies it's real huge and a bit scary how many different files are in How would you like to make it easier? Do you have an idea? Um, first of all one very important step is to talk with us as we are the ones who are really managing the forests and I'm missing this a bit because um, Marcus just said, come to the commission and then ask for a meeting or something, and we will talk to you. So we try every now and then, to be honest. And uh, I tried to talk to one colleague from the DJ environment, and I, tr I tried it now since one, a y one year almost, but I was not successful so far. So it's, we can show a lot, and this is, I think, the important message also here for for this group that we should bring them to our forest because sometimes really it seems to be hard to understand as we saw as you have made these kind of um, questions what society thinks of uh, forests when you ask them what they have in their mind and the wood and timber was just there on the right edge. That's a very strong and important point when you say that the commission services who should be our partner is not talking to you in a private partnership, this is called passive aggressiveness. <laughs> so what, how do we change? Because this cannot be. We have to have a dialogue. We have to tell like, okay, if you're from environment or from any other directorate, I just take your example. Uh, working for our sector, please listen. What does it mean for us in our reality? How can we probably get this dialogue established? Helga, you're smiling. What would you propose? Um, well, uh, right at this moment, actually, there is a dialogue in the European, uh, in, in the European Union. Uh, the, Mr. Sefcovic has invited um, the stakeholders and also scientists to uh, an important event. And this afternoon, there will also be a closed event uh, where my director will give a speech on um, the bioeconomy and the role of science uh, and forests. Um, and I think uh, this dialogue uh, will be something that will be looked for more. Uh, you could already see in the uh, speech of uh, the current uh, president of the commission, Mrs. van der Leyen, who said that uh, she wants to have more of this dialogue. Um, and uh, we have to see, of course, uh, how this uh, develops once we have the new European Parliament um, uh, working, and then with this also a new commission and a new commission president, or a new old one, let's see. Um, uh, but um, I see that um, this message of dialogue, or the needed for, uh, dialogue has uh, uh, arrived, uh, or at least that's my hunch on it. Um, but I think we should not only ha uh, look for the dialogue with the European Commission, we should also look for dialogue at the national level and with the national administration and with the regional administration uh, and also with the industry. Um, but uh, please don't forget, we should, uh, as I said also before, look for dialogue with scientists as well. Super. Who of you in this room had talked to the Commission in the last five years. Raise your hand. Whom of you in this room had talked on a national level to your policy makers? Raise your hands. It's a bit more, it's a bit more. On the regional level, please raise your hands. You see? When you talk on the regional level, do you also hear that the Brussels programs Marcos has perfectly presented that may help you exist and will fund whatever kind of need you have? Raise your hand. Do you hear from the Brussels programs and the opportunities that are there on the regional level? Raise your hands. Well, you're in research. That's good. Two, three. It's not bad, but a lot of... Yes, you get... You heard from this on the regional level. 
No, no, don't worry, I'm, I'm not scaring you. This is not the teacher to <laughs> make an exam, okay? This is just, you, you get the feeling, there are already some of you there, but there's more potential. And Helga, what you said is talking to the actors on the region, and Franz, you're one of those. How is it in practice now with IUFRO? You're dealing with research on the global scale. Research is always giving visions, some results, some statements how it is. How would you be able to help, for example, with this on the regional level? What we do at UFRO is, uh, first of all, we put together the science that is out there, and then we try to bring this science to people who may need it, uh, not only decision makers, but also uh, people at the subnational level, regional level, uh, to uh, private industry, to anyone who may use this kind of information to make uh, more mm, adequate decisions and some things we do are uh, based on uh, on science of course because we are a scientific organization but then we try to involve uh, people in in workshops we try to establish this kind of dialogues to share knowledge and information we try to um, give some sort of additional training and education to people who may need it in, in their daily lives, in their uh, practice work. And we do that not only through the publications that I mentioned before, that we have some outside, but also through um, more practical uh, courses, practical trainings, and also we try to uh, promote this sort of communication that my colleagues were mentioning, if someone from the regional level needs to go to uh, Brussels and stay there for uh, a week to talk to someone, sometimes we have funding for that if uh, it's needed and if it's applied uh, through uh, the channels we have. Are you aware of that? They can help you. Whom of you, from the practical point of view, and please, not the research guys, don't raise your hand, but you as the practitioners, or you're in the administration, or whatever you're doing, who is benefiting or participating in research or using research results? Please raise your hands. Thank you. There's a gap. There is. There's a huge gap, which is good that you, yeah, well, you can say like this is fine. Some of the things is probably un subconsciously or unconsciously used. But we see here a gap. We see a lot of activities ongoing, but they should be here to serve each of you on the ground. What, when your daily work does not mean that you're daily in contact with research, but we are all facing in Europe and the Basque country worldwide the same challenges. And you have questions and you need support because none of us can solve what has been perfectly presented by you alone. So if I see five people raising their hands, then I say like, okay, there's something we have to improve because there is all these programs, there's a lot of great knowledge that has been presented by you. There's even more expertise available and you should not be alone in your daily life. So how do we manage that you know where to go and that you get this knowledge? Who wants to start? I already heard you say you do trainings, you offer these opportunities so people should understand that you are there for some specific needs. What would be your point of view, Marcos? You had been working in Finland in different levels and now in Brussels. What would you think? Because you have perfectly presented all the different directorates with different hierarchies, different strategies, but Europe is here. Everyone here in the room is a Basque European or Spanish European or French European or German or Swedish. Indian, German, European, so we are Europe. How do we make it happen? <laughs> <laughs> so that, uh, can you hear? 
So that was the question that my colleague was warning me about. Eh? <laughs> but uh, I, I have to say, so I, I, I hear you, of course, that you were trying to, to get meetings with, with the Commission. And uh, I mean, it's also face the fact that uh, people are super busy, like you are very super busy, but in the Commission it's, it's also super busy. And of course, uh, if you get an email, okay, a meeting is arranged. And I have to say the best stakeholder meetings that, that I'm in, sitting there on the Commission side, but also there on the other side, from the Ministry side or from the research side, are those meetings where there's a clear, clear message. A clear message from the stakeholder also. So you have to be very pre good prepared. And uh, we are taking our time, you're taking uh, your, your time, but it's, it's quite often that, okay, a meeting is arranged and, okay, and uh, the, the director asks now something else, so, uh, okay, let's go to the meeting. And there you have to have the material ready. Eh? So it's, it's what you say, but also the material that you give to us. Because, okay, meeting was well, everybody's satisfied, everybody goes back to their own offices and you go home again. But uh, you may remember if you have something on the table from your organization, where there are the main messages, because you do a lot of other work and then you remember, ah, okay. So this is also very important, how you communicate and what you communicate. And then and also another form is that we also have to learn the good examples that you have in your countries, in the, the regions. So for example, if you have an integrated forest management, integrated forest management means that you use the resource, but you also at the same time, sometimes a bit challenging on the same area, but also take into consideration the ec ecological side. And you can prove this with data and information, and that it's, it's ideal. An example is, uh, sorry, I'm going back to Finland, but an example is that uh, we have the, the Forest Industry Association. They started two years ago a study to see what was the development on forest biodiversity for the past 30 years? And why past 30 years? Because in Finland, we had in the 1990s, we focused on a legislative mm -hmm. base, especially on enhancing biodiversity in, in the forest, related to forest management. So they started the study, and there we were in fortune to have the National Forest Inventory, and in Finland already for over 100 years. So we were able to show on certain key indicators like the development of that wood, leaving old big trees in the forest, aspen trees, very, very important, not only for the flying squirrel, but also for other, other uh, for, for insects. Huh? So we can show this, the development, and this is something positive, and then it's communicated to us, to the policymakers. And I know the same is also happening in Sweden, so perhaps you, from, from Spain or for the Basque country, you have the same example. And that this is very important for us to know because uh, there, there are also other sto stories. So we, because we hear so many stories, we hear stories that, uh, I mean, climate change is happening, eh? don't get me wrong. Eh? So that, that's, that's, it's, it's a big message. But of course, it's a, it's a negative and catastrophic, catastrophic event. It overturns also the, the positive positive things that are happening. So there, here you, you come in. And uh, I mean, the European Commission, it, sorry to say that, but it's also you. Huh? So because you're funding the European Commission and you, you have to go not only to the European Commission, but you also have to go to the national administration. Sorry if I continue stay for, for two minutes. Uh, now we see a bit shift, and uh, Helga mentioned that the, the stakeholder dialogue, so this is something that has, there's a shift now in the Commission for the past months, after von der Leyen, and then we had the change in the Vice, vice, um, vice President, now it's Sefkowitz. So now the idea of the Commission is to engage stakeholders, and it's uh, research. It's the forest owner, CEPF. It's the forest industry. It's the ENGO. So they are there now in Brussels, discussing, and the idea is to better understand the concerns. Should it have happened earlier? Yes, but better later than, than never. So that's one point, and I still continue for one minute, <laughs> is that um, now the last big regulation related to, to forests is the EU forest monitoring for resilient forests. 
And here we can see a shift that this file is now discussed under the Agrifish Council. So there's an ad hoc working party under the Agrifish Council. And I think that's very important because in the, in the council meetings there we have both ministries involved. So it's the agriculture and forestry, uh, of course I know that it's a bit different in the European countries, but agriculture and forestry, but also the environment. So I think it's very important that those two are together in the meetings, hearing the proposal from the Commission in establishing this EO forest uh, monitoring system, what indicators are integrated in there, uh, how do we obtain the data, is it ground-based data, is it uh, remote sense data, are they combined? And here it's very important that we have the specialists there telling, okay, Commission, uh, this is working, uh, this is not working, what you are proposing. Eh? So that's, that's a very important stage. And uh, uh, I mean, something that is uh, positive in my, not only the stakeholder, but also that we have now both sides at the table discussing on forest related issues. Super. Because, sorry, the third minute, uh, it's, it's, oh. not, it's not, it's not, all, it's because, uh, yes, so uh, it is an environment issue, the, the forest, but it's it's the same time it's also a forest forestry, forestry issue. So it's I, I personally I see a lot of positive development, but I've only been there one year. I know where the copy machine is, so I don't know anything. Eh? <laughs> well, for knowing the copy machine, that was a lot of information. Thank you. And uh, we have a first question from the audience, urgent. Please introduce yourself quickly and then raise the question. Sí, soy Iñaki Guerrero Navarrena. Oh, wait, wait, please. Okay. Uh, yes, please, wait. Yes, yes. Bye. Andres. Bye. As naked? Uh, no. Please. Okay. Chingolo. Sí, soy Iñaki Guerrero Navarrena y soy técnico de ASI Fundase Yoa, una fundación del gobierno vasco que, tema, que lleva temas forestales. Eh, nos estáis diciendo y nos estáis hablando de eh, mensajes claros eh, y yo eh, primero quiero agradecer la posibilidad que nos dais de que podamos preguntar directamente, ¿no? Eh, nosotros estamos necesitados de mensajes claros y yo eh, nos habéis dicho que no hagamos desarrollo sino preguntas. Eh, sinceramente lo digo, yo creo que nosotros desde el punto de vista técnico no sabemos qué es lo que queréis eh, y no sabemos qué es lo que quiere la Unión Europea porque no lo entendemos. Y, y cuando se vienen y, y hoy que estamos en una eh, jornada de modelos forestales y de hacia dónde va Europa, yo sinceramente tengo una pregunta muy simple y muy clara. Y es, eh, ¿la Unión Europea quiere ser autosuficiente en madera y en otros productos que eh, sustituyan a los productos fósiles? ¿Sí o no? Y si es que sí, ¿cómo tenemos que hacerlo? Eh, cuando se legisla, question. quería hacer otras dos más, simplemente, y, y, voy a ser, y, no, y no voy a ser, no voy a, eh, solo voy a preguntar. Cuando se legisla, eh, ¿tenéis en cuenta la variable de se necesita eh, producir para ser autosuficiente desde el punto de vista europeo? ¿Sí o no? Y luego cuando vemos alguna de las legislaciones que estáis poniendo encima de la mesa, que ya no son directivas, sino que son reglamentos y van a ser de aplicación directa, y oímos que nos decís eso de... Eh, bueno, ya veremos cómo se implementan. Los reglamentos se implementan por la vía de la ley. Y tanto en los temas de monitorización como en los de restauración de la naturaleza, antes he hablado del principio de subsidiariedad. Es que se acaba con el principio de subsidiariedad. Y yo me pregunto y le pregunto directamente a la Unión Europea y a sus representantes. ¿Quiere en el, en el ámbito forestal la Unión Europea acabar con el principio de subsidiariedad? ¿Sí o no? Porque la verdad es que parece que sí. Muchas gracias. Uh, before you answer, if you allow me to give you an answer, because uh, the monitoring system that is very polemic, actually I've been involved in this for some years already behind the scenes. And here's the complexity that what uh, Marcus has perfectly said, for environmental issues, the Commission services has the mandate. So they're even asked to put things forward to do the best they can for the environment. And if you allow me to quote, it's not at all against forest management or use of wood. So this is absolutely wrong when this is communicated to the people, okay? 
The other thing is the complexity that Markus, when he will have his three minutes uh, answer soon, is like DG Agriculture, as he present, is involved, climate is involved, growth is involved, research is involved. And um, I fully understand your question in terms of like how to communicate and your needs. And after Markus will reply to you, I will ask Franz from your point of view if you want to answer to that because you're a practitioner with your enterprise in Bavaria. And then I would really like you, everyone, just ask a question what you need and can they fulfill that? Because now we have a chance really to test how this communication can work. Markus, please, three minutes. <coughs> no, I, I will be I will be shorter this time. So don't don't worry. Yeah, thanks thanks a lot for for the the questions. Uh, I don't know if the translation works so well. I, I think very very good the trans, trans translator. Um, from n not not from the commission because I cannot com uh, represent all the commission services. Neither can I represent uh, Ursula von der Leyen. So uh, I think we have to understand a bit the level of. Uh, of uh, where, where we are sitting here. Uh, from DG Agri point of view, and as a, as a specialist, and a specialist, specialist, but expert, and I have said expertise, I would not see that uh, our aim is to, to, to stop using uh, wood, wood as a resource. So I think. So now this communication or the, the, the dialogue, I think it's, it's already a good step of opening and a bit better understanding uh, what is really, what is, what is happening. And uh, we had in, in the EU, from, from commission side, we had the, the EU uh, bioeconomy bio strategy. And this was a bit uh, a challenge because it was a for, forgotten uh, child in this, this commission because it was still under the last commission. And, uh, but now we are starting to, to, to rethink, rethink the bioeconomy because we have now a lot of discussions on bioeconomy. There will be a communication uh, soon set out by the commission on biotechnology. So I think here we realize that we do not want to stop to use wood as a product because it has so much possibilities and we have also to understand also that we we have to create the environment also for the industry so industry in my point of view plays also a very important part uh, sorry again coming with the finnish example or the nordic example We're but the, the, the country Was this a point of saying you're you're too long? No. Uh, uh, so here, the forest industry plays a very important part because besides the bulk pulp and paper, they also created the same time side streams, new product that are replacing the fossil based uh, fuels. So that they are very important. We have to understand, and we should not uh, limit limit ourselves uh, too much. And uh, uh, I mean. I couldn't agree with you more that uh, we have to see that we are self self efficient eh? and uh, I don't know what the next commission uh, has on their agenda because we do not know how the commission will look like we do not know how the parliament will look like but I'm sure that's, that that uh, competitiveness self efficiency will be on the big big agenda unfortunately also security and I think that's that's a, a bit that we f forget quite quite often is that I mean all the money that is put in the security in buying arms in mu ammunition it could be used in such a more wise way. But I understand you also. <laughs> I think it's not three minutes. I understand you also that uh, uh, it look like it looks like and uh, I think Helga's example of all the the forest related uh, instruments. I, I mean. There, there are so much that is going on in forest, and we have the deforestation and degradation regulation, which aims. Uh, so the big goal is to reduce the deforestation that is related to seven commodities. Like stop, stop. Okay. Is this answering your question? But no. Maybe I just, can... uh, just one. Yeah. Before that, I would like to give one comment. I'm half Finn. God bless my mother, but uh, she was from Finland. We cannot use the Finnish model for Europe. Finland is totally different. You have four tree species, 
In France, we have 136 in the forest already, differently structured, different ownership type, what Marcus perfectly presented. Metza Group, for example, is a company, one of the biggest in our sector, that is based on the creation by 100,000 private forest owners. Well, if I ask you to do that in the bus countries, I probably will be killed and like the whale hunters will come and search for me in the water. I think we should not compare, and the most important, it's a good example, but this example cannot be used somewhere else, not even in Sweden. And the Swedish forest industries is differently structured than the Finnish, different specialization, different uh, opportunities. But I but think I, that I, was I, really so, good. Sorry, so, with, with all respect, but I, 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 I want to come back because I, I understand you. Yeah? But what I wanted to say in the end was that uh, Okay, we cannot use the Finnish example, but uh, can we use the example of a cooperative? And I think here in Spain or in the Basque country, I think you also have the idea of the cooperative because companies like Metso, this big forest industry, it's a cooperative. So it's a, it's a, they're the forest owners, owners together, deciding together what to go, go where to go on which innovative project we, we are focusing. So I think th yes. there we can go. Super. But I, I understand you, so that... Yep, thank you. Yeah. So Franz, the Nelson, there are other questions, and I would actually like, if you're okay, Tamus, to say something, because the cooperatives were asked, and Tamus is with us today. He's the Director General of the French uh, Umbrella Organization for the Forestry Cooperatives. First, the two gentlemen, and then please, more questions from the audience. Franz. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, just a question. I really liked it because I, I think we just have to stop increasing the restrictions, building up more and more restrictions. And this is what I have as a feeling because as a forest manager, we are producing locally sourced timber. So this is one thing. So why go outside of Europe if we have our locally product? So it's the same here in the Basque land. And we should use this. It's, it's an opportunity. And then the thing is, if we have building up all these policy issues and files, so it... It sounds nice, it sounds great, and as I know today, the Commission is having a workshop on bioeconomy, and if you read this, the concept, you really feel comfortable. But then what you see on the ground, I'm not really believing it every time. So this is the question how and what the way should be, as uh, the Vice Minister asked today, where, where to go? And I think we should be honest with us, we need the timber and we need the rural areas. It shouldn't be a lip service just to say it's great and we need it and then you're increasing restrictions with EUDR and other policy files. So this doesn't work. And so for me, it's important, but I'm also honestly, I really appreciate it that he's open to talk to us because I know that, that it's more complex and there are other DGs and other kind of institution. So again, the communication is good, but then we also have to feel that there's a real interest for the forest managers on the ground. Yes, and every region is different. Nelson, would you like to comment? Yes, uh, I would like to say something from the point of view of uh, science, that uh, an example to answer that question, that uh, it's what I showed during the presentation, that we, as, as scientists, we have partnered with uh, private industry to uh, look for solutions for the future of uh, wood supply in Europe. And I think these kind of partnerships are important and, and uh, they have uh, better basis and, and more strength to uh, deal with these kind of problems. And when forest owners or, or, or the industry want to talk to uh, politicians or the policymakers, when they have this background of uh, organized and, and evidence-based uh, reasoning, they have more strength to deal with uh, the policies to be implemented and, and to be uh, developed. Great, thanks. Okay, there's another question from the audience. Sí. Bueno, mi nombre es Juan Miguel Villarroel y represento a la Asociación Forestal de, de Navarra. <coughs> Lo primero, dar las gracias al Gobierno vasco y a USE, especialmente la figura de, de Leire y de Durne, el, el curro y el trabajo que se, han, que se han llevado, y la oportunidad que nos dan a la gente que somos locales o regionales de poder acceder a vosotros. Entonces sí que voy a hacer algunas preguntas, pero también quiero transmitir algunas ideas desde el mundo del territorio a, al mundo más de Bruselas. ¿no? 
Eh, hemos hablado o habéis hablado de la resiliencia de los bosques. Eh, me gustaría que os llevarais eh, en, vuestro, en vuestra mente la resiliencia que tienen que, también, que tienen que tener también los propietarios forestales, eh, que cada vez están más cansados, más decepcionados y más desilusionados. Eh. Esto lo traigo desde el territorio del día a día. ¿no? Eh, se abre una ventana de esperanza cuando Bichor y Leire han dicho que bueno, la no gestión no es una opción. Esperemos que eso sea así. Y luego, Nelson, has hablado, me ha parecido muy bien, cuando has explicado un poco los, los, los tres grandes problemas ¿no? que se han ido incrementando, con que hay más actores, más ONGs, más, eso, más actores que al final dificultan eh, cómo debemos gestionar el territorio. ¿no? Pero aparte, si eso fuera poco, has añadido la financiación privada, que también hace que políticas o cosas se lleven a hacer cosas en el territorio que son las que manda el dinero, ¿no? Pero a más a más has introducido el, el diseño de, de, de nuevas normas y de nuevas leyes. ¿no? La pregunta, primera pregunta, en vez de hacer tantas leyes, ¿no es posible clarear, eh, podar, cortar y hacer menos leyes, simplificar, hacer menos burocracia, menos papeleo? Porque cuando llega, llega todo eso al territorio es muy difícil, pero incluso las propias administraciones, la, los técnicos de la administración también tienen su problemática para justificar todo el dinero. Y nos estamos encontrando en el territorio que a veces para hacer eh, actuaciones que tenemos que ejecutar y que son la silvicultura o cosas, nos cuesta más eh, justificar el dinero o todos los trámites o toda la burocracia que hay que hacer que lo que es el, el trabajar en el territorio. ¿no? Eso es una cosa que está pasando ahora mismo. Me da igual desde proyectos de Fundación de Biodiversidad, de Europa, de, de todas las administraciones, todo se complica muchísimo. Eh, tenemos en contra los medios de comunicación, o sea, nosotros tenemos que demostrar, da igual que tengamos los, los sellos PFS, FSC, que hagamos gestión forestal sostenible, da igual, siempre tenemos en contra la opinión. Tú vas a un colegio y en un colegio cortar un árbol es malo, el motoserrista es el, el asesino, cuando del bosque, cuando logramos transformar que ese motoserrista sea el cirujano y no el asesino, habremos dado un paso de gigante, ¿no? Y eso nos está costando muchísimo a la propiedad forestal. Y por último, eh, a, la, a la señora Elga, bueno, pues me ha encantado que, que estén dispuestos los científicos y los políticos a, a poder bajar un poco de dónde están y venir al territorio. Nosotros encantados de que vengáis para ver las masas, los bosques y a lo que, y a lo que has dicho, eh, Andreas, que el propietario no está en el monte, que has dicho, que cuesta encontrar al propietario contrario a los agricultores. Bueno, si nos llamas estamos y podemos, y podemos enseñarte los bosques. Y respecto a los incendios, está bien que compréis dos aviones para temas de extinción, pero lo que siempre nos ha preocupado a la propiedad y a los que trabajamos en el, en el, en el, en el tema forestal es la prevención. Nuestros padres ya nos decían, prevenir es mejor que curar. Entonces, la, la prevención, la prevención, la prevención. Y eso es un poco lo que desde... Por lo menos en mi organización de propietarios os quiero trasladar en este encuentro y agradecer eh, que hayáis querido venir aquí y, y sobre todo a dar la cara y a estar. ¿eh? Muchísimas gracias. Fantástico. So, who wants to start, Helga? Is it you? You're smiling. Uh, I just want to say a very quick uh, answer to the gentleman before before I go to your question. When you talked about subsidiarity and does the European Union want to get rid of it, I, my clear answer is no. Yes. Uh, because the idea of uh, European integration, harmonization, is actually to do only things when it's needed at the European Union scale. And it seems that uh, it's needed to do something in certain aspects um, uh, with relation to forest. And this is why the Commission has made proposals and then the Council and the Parliament have agreed to them. Uh, so, uh, no. Uh, but uh, then coming to your question on um, communication. Uh, communication is, of course, key also for scientists nowadays. Um, um, and also talking to the media is key. Uh, because we don't only have uh, negative messages, we have a lot of positive messages as well, and the scientific um, knowledge should also be communicated. But then you said, is it the possibility to get rid of uh, legislation or targets or objectives? Yes, it is a possibility. It's just more unrealistic and very unlikely, because um, 
uh, think that you you um, have been elected newly to a government, and then you have to take back the uh, decisions that uh, maybe party colleagues have uh, taken before uh, with the majority of your own party. Is this possible? Yes, in terms of crisis situation, this might be possible, but um, it might be more unlikely. And in the European Union, it's, of course, much more complex because it's 27 member countries, the majority of the countries that need to agree, and then the MEPs, they need also to agree. So it's quite complex. But I also have to say in terms of implementation, not every legislation is well implemented. So in a way, it can also say, you could also say it's taken back because it's not implemented well. But um, yeah, that's just from my side. Great, fantastic. Just to, to add something, because it's nice to sit next to you, Helga, and I just learned that last week um, the Austrian agricultural minister and the Bavarian minister for agriculture signed the Salzburg Declaration. So this is something where you feel that member states and also regional governments really try to step up and bring up their voice. The question is then how this is uh, received at the governmental um, level. But this is really a good example as our regional government is really trying to say support uh, sustainable forest management and they are sending this message. Super. Is it communication or is it establishing a dialogue? What is better? In this case, it's a kind of a test. I would not directly say it's communication. Good. But it's, I mean, it's to sending a message. Anyhow, it's being the first step then to also going into conversations. That's important, of course. Someone else from the panel you would like to comment on the great questions? Just very briefly, I would like to uh, agree and support with uh, what Helga has mentioned as an answer. And also, uh, when our colleague mentioned that uh, there are more actors, there are uh, more ways of financing, I think what is needed is a way to communicate, but communicate for coordination. So uh, establish paths so people can get together and discuss the issues, so there can be a better coordination, which will in turn affect uh, how policies are developed, because then they will be developed for the specific purpose of a region or, or a sector or uh, more concrete uh, actions. Super. Yeah. No, don't worry. <laughs> no, 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 you're totally free. Yes, who was the first one? I think, Thomas, please. Thank you. I'll, I just will speak in French, which is my native language. Just the time. Donc, je, je représente les, les coopératives forestières en France. Merci beaucoup pour, pour l'invitation. J'ai plusieurs questions pour les panélistes et, et des remarques. Ce que je vois sur les, sur les politiques européennes depuis maintenant une quinzaine d'années, c'est qu'il y a un, un écart grandissant entre l'ambition politique des textes qui sont proposés et les capacités de mise en œuvre de ces mêmes textes. Et nous, au niveau des coopératives forestières, en France, nous regroupons 120 000 propriétaires forestiers. On récolte 7,6 millions de mètres cubes de bois pour les industries françaises. On reboise environ 20 000 hectares de, de forêt et donc nous mettons en œuvre toutes les actions de, de gestion forestière durable qui sont pratiquées en France et, et, et ailleurs. Euh, je, ce que je vois, c'est que ça ne se fera pas sans nous. Les politiques européennes et nationales ne peuvent se faire si les forestiers ne sont pas impliqués, parce que y a, je, vois, je vois deux risques. Le premier risque, c'est qu'on ne fera rien, on ne fera plus. Et donc, du coup, on ne pourra pas adapter les forêts au changement climatique qui impactent toutes les forêts européennes, que ce soit des forêts feuillues ou des forêts résineuses. On ne créera pas d'emplois en milieu rural. Et on utilisera quand même toujours du bois, des produits bois, qui viendront non plus du Pays basque, non plus d'Espagne, non plus de France, mais qui viendront peut-être du Canada, d'Indonésie, du Congo. Donc, à la question est, que voulons-nous Que voulons-nous collectivement et, et, et ma question, c'est euh, comment arriver à combler cet écart entre les décisions européennes et l'arrêté du terrain C'est à la fois une question en interne pour les fédérations professionnelles que, dans lesquelles moi je travaille. 
on est en lien avec les fédérations européennes. Et, et merci encore pour le travail réalisé par l'USSE qui, 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 qui fait ce job et qui le fait bien. Mais manifestement, nous ne faisons pas suffisamment entendu. Nos détracteurs le sont plus, alors que eux ne sont pas en charge de mettre en œuvre. Et là, il y a une vraie différence. Et j'ai beaucoup apprécié le... J'ai beaucoup apprécié le, le, le discours de EFI, qui veut dire que dans la gouvernance, il y a effectivement la décision d'orienter les politiques et également de s'assurer qu'elles sont mises en œuvre. Donc les acteurs de la mise en œuvre, les propriétaires forestiers privés, les coopératives, les industriels du bois, devraient davantage être entendus ou écoutés, parce qu'à un moment, sinon, ça ne se fera pas. Donc j'aurais bien voulu avoir votre, votre, votre retour, parce que nous voyons qu'il y a quand même des opportunités qui sont phénoménales au niveau européen. Vous avez montré les financements dédiés, vous avez montré l'ambition. Euh, maintenant, comment faire pour reconnecter ces textes à notre, à notre euh, problématique de terrain Et comme vous l'avez dit, toutes les forêts sont différentes, tous les contextes sont différents. Et, euh, et nous poussons pour, pour essayer de cranter ce sujet-là, mais on a encore du mal à le faire comprendre. Merci. Très belle question. Merci beaucoup, Tamus. Qui veut... Oh, sorry, who would start to reply Is there, or do you share, because that was really good, and please now wake up, this is your moment, just start talking, this is exactly what we need, the reality. We see the ambitions, reality, and there's somehow a gap between the two, but what, uh, if I summarize quickly in English, don't, don't be offended, there's so much money, but how can it help us? And how can we find in the Brussels jungle of regulations the right program for us. USA is doing a fantastic job. I fully agree some others. But still, USA is also, in this case, depending on, and this is a good question because one cannot do all. You're nodding. Please, let's start with Marcos. You hadn't talked for five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I talked already too much. No, ah, yeah. But you're here. Uh, you have yeah, I, I, hear, I, I, hear, I hear you again, and I understand you. You see me like... Uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> well, it's, it's, it's super complex. And uh, I mean, I, uh, uh, on the danger of repeating myself, but you have to, you have to, you have to speak up. And this is a good forum. But you also have to go really to the DGs that are in charge of the of the file. Eh? And I, I know I know it's 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 not easy. And I have to say, until the regulation is not published in the official journal of the Commission, everything is possible. So we see this in the last five minutes of negotiations mm. that somebody is in the room and thinks like, hey, I have to bring in this uh, because it's super important. And then we have the how we say in German, we have the salad because. Then you see, really see it's super. It's not impl 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 so you cannot implement it because it's it's super difficult. The idea might be right behind it, but there's a lack also to the the connection to the practical world world in in my, in my point. Can, of view. So that's that's why we need. Can it. I help you here? Sorry, I don't want to be rude, but because I had been involved there in Brussels. Who in this room heard of bioeconomy? The word bioeconomy. Raise your hand. Bioeconomy. Who of you identifies as a bioeconomist? <laughs> you see? Yeah, well, exactly you. you. We are all, but we do not know. You know where this term comes from? It comes from the research programming. And why? Because you had, do you remember like 20 years ago, a bit more, I was young at that time, and there was one word which was really the hottest thing in Europe, nanotechnology, nanosciences. Everybody was obsessed. This will create the full employment in Europe. This will put Europe as number one. Do nanotechnologies, do nanosciences. So agriculture, forestry, fisheries, everything related on bio, biological resources was practically out. So Dr. Christian Patermann from the Commission Services used the word bioeconomy that had been used in some publications a long time ago. Even I think it was a French colleague of us some hundred years ago who used it first time to defend our sector and agriculture and all the others to get funding for research in our area. So it's a political term 
which is very powerful in the Brussels negotiation. You understand it perfectly. Everybody on the stage who had been involved. On the ground, nobody. If I talk to First Transformation, Sawmill or others, and I said, you're a bioeconomist. What? I'm a sawmiller. To identify the concept is so complex, in reality, isn't it? that you think, yeah, but if it's agriculture, why do I have to be there as well? If it's fishery from Iceland, what do I have to do with fisheries? And okay, you have some relations with Iceland. It has changed, thank God, some years ago. But um, do you understand in this huge complexity, the language, what you said, and you said perfectly, please talk to us, and you made this statement, what shall, I, shall we tell you? Do you understand our needs? There are some terminologies which are extremely important for us here in the, in the political debate and the programming and defending the budgets for us. But then when it comes to when you leave the room in Brussels, and it's not only us here, I can promise you because I work with practically most of those bioeconomy people, they were all like fisheries do not identify, agriculture do not identify, even biorefineries do not identify with the bioeconomy. But it's the number one word in the political debate that's very good for us. So you don't have to, because I don't even know how to identify, please, that was to support you, please continue. Thank, thank you so much, Andreas, thank you for your kind, kind support. Uh, and I also like, on, honestly, uh, coming back to Finland. So I, I understand the concerns of the Nordic countries, to some extent also of Germany. I've been living there for 23 years. I was born there. So I understand those, but I may not understand, or my colleagues may not understand your Basque problems or Spanish problems. And here comes the trick. You have to find in the commission your countrymen, your countrywomen, to, because they are also mentally touched to what you are saying, because they have their own history. And uh, of course, I can understand uh, European and I uh, understand the Austrians. And, and so, but am I really to touch to, to what's going on? Do I have a history here? No, I don't, I, I don't, I can listen, I can understand. But so, so here's the trick, search in the commission for the people you talk to from your own country, from your own region. I think there you have a better chance of being heard in my point of view. Personally point of view, it's not the view of the Commission, it's not the view of the Jacri. I have to stress that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other of you would like to comment to the question? Yes, please, Helga. Uh, I would like to say uh, the concern that you voiced uh, is really important um, because um, the more targets and the more objectives are being developed at the European Union level, the more complex it is in implementation. So one way forward would actually be to look at these objectives and see where are the synergies and where are the trade-offs between them and maybe discuss it from this perspective. This could also help the Commission to foresee where is it that uh, effective implementation is more possible and where not. But I want to emphasize one aspect as well. Uh, when we heard already this morning, you should bring the good examples uh, and see what works. Please don't forget to also bring the examples that don't work, because otherwise we have a selection bias, which we call in science. We only uh, select spe specific things, but we never talk about what did not work. I know it's very hard for our regions or member states to say what doesn't work, because you always, everyone wants to shine. But I think shining can also be in saying what does not work, uh, because so other people or other regions would not replicate it. And this is a learning process as well. And you can learn from other regions at the same time. Right. Super good. Is there, would you like to reply? Because we get a question from Francisco. But I, I, yes. I would, Helga made a very important point. Also the negative you have to learn. Yeah. But then I think it was very important also that uh, it's not like coming and screaming at the decision makers. I think what is very important also to bring in the solutions that you, you can also present to us. And I think that that's, that's okay because then you're already 
uh, I mean, it's like we're communicating with people, uh, uh, not ev always very easy, but uh, it, it's much easier if, if you are friendly to each other and like, okay, we have the solution. Uh, okay, it doesn't work like this because uh, the forest owners are not interested anymore, but here's the solution for you. And then it, it, I think that would be, very, it would be in either work, would work very well, my point of view. Okay. Person. There's a direct co comment or? Francesco, please, go ahead. Muy buenos días. Gracias por la invitación. Uh, Forestis es una uh, asociación uh, florestal de Portugal. Tenemos en nuestro seno uh, 34 cooperativas y asociaciones florestales y estamos uh, en todo el país. Um, la floresta portuguesa es un poco distinta. Tenemos 3,3 millones de hectáreas de floresta. Tenemos 98% es privada, es el país con más eh, floresta privada, solamente 2% es pública. Tenemos 30% de floresta de conservación, bonita, muy bien, eh, alguna muy bien eh, querida, otra menos querida, pero lo que nos preocupa esencialmente es que estas 98% están en la mano de 410 mil propietarios florestales. Mm. 350 mil propietarios florestales tienen menos de 3 hectáreas. Yo también soy un de ellos, uh, soy un pequeño propietario florestal y es un problema muy grave. Tenemos en nuestras organizaciones que, fo que Forestes dirige algunos modelos muy interesantes de eh, soluciones que nacen desde la base, con las llamadas áreas agrupadas, contamos 150, 170, 200 propietarios florestales, para gerirmos en conjunto. Estamos intentando replicar esto en todo el país, mas tenemos un problema. Nuestra, nuestra forma de gerir la floresta, que nace de la base, que nace del propietario, no es apoyada por las políticas públicas, ni nacionales, ni comunitarias. Aquí está el gran problema. Señor Francisco, usted tiene que juntar 2.500 hectáreas. Usted tiene... No. Las políticas que nos llegan son políticas que olvidaron por completo el propietario florestal y sus inquietudes en el terreno, muchas veces también eh, no escuchando la industria, porque la industria debe ser aquí al, a, 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 una entidad muy importante en la hilera que nos puede apoyar con verdaderas herramientas de fomento florestal, y nosotros también lo seguimos, porque la madera importada cuesta mucho más dinero do que la madera producida en Portugal. Producimos cerca de 10 millones de toneladas uh, año. Uh, Portugal, entre la filera del pinos y la filera del eucalipto. Y lo que nos sentimos es que estamos un poco abandonados y es la razón que Portugal tiene 32,3% de la floresta abandonada y, en consecuencia, todos los años, es la desgracia que usted sabe. Floresta abandonada es como una casa abandonada. Y nosotros, portugueses, nos encantaría que la floresta fuera nuestra casa, nuestra casa conjunta de toda la Europa. Señores de la Comisión, ¿qué piensan ustedes sobre esto? Y si no piensan que sería muy importante también tener políticas adaptables al minifundio florestal. Gracias. Thank you very much. That was very important. And I like very much your metaphor, the image that's a house where we should live in and not abandon. Direct comment. I think that's... I, 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 I will ask you a question soon because we talk all around something like a phantom thing that is missing. I hear it from everyone, but who wants to comment or reply? Yes? Marcus, three minutes. <laughs> so that's uh, my colleague warned me about uh, all the questions we beat to, to the commission. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Senor. That was very, very good to, to also learn. And uh, I think this information is uh, important when we 
I learned that we are going to review the, the delegated acts, the climate delegated acts, and uh, <laughs> for, for my time. Eh? But uh, now we have the, the unfortunate uh, figure of uh, 13 hectares. So if it's above 13 hectares, uh, we, we, the, the, the forest owner then has to, has to prove it. So I think what here we could perhaps look at from the Commission side personally, and I don't know what the future Commission does, is to have more flexibility, this regional flexibility to really see what, what, what is the situation. Because what we, I think what we are not interested in is that the forest owner stops the management. Eh? So, and we see the examples that uh, a lot of uh, material in the forest can create forest fire. So that, that's, we, we should not be interested in that because in my point of view, we can create many, many, many services Services, the, 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 the key word huh? for, for, for the society, in my point of view. <laughs> and uh, I mean, we can protect the area, and I think that's ve very important protected forest areas, national parks, uh, uh, the, the strict protected areas, national parks for, for recreation. But uh, we also, uh, also have to see that uh, it's a dynamic system, the forest. So uh, uh, it's, it's, it, of course, it is about storing the carbon. Yeah, so okay, but it's also about secret state in the carbon, and I think we we understand very well here in the room uh, uh, when uh, for carbon is is uh, sequestrated the best. So I go not into detail. Yeah? So I think we have to understand this better, and the concerns of the private forest owners, and that we have really small private forest owners. And uh, yeah, so thank you very much. I I take good note. Thank you. Thank you. Someone else on the panel? Would you like to comment? I mean, I'm sometimes wondering if these messages really have not ever been sent to the Commission and it's the first time you're hearing about this. So I think we have a really good job, Larry, you with your association and others as well, also on the EU level in, in Brussels, doing a good job and trying to, to convey the messages. So is this enough, Franz? This is really good. This is where I want to go to. How can we help them? No, they work like crazy, but we still talk about something is missing. No, but just another point before you come back to this, I mean, it's all also about the attractivity because I think we're risking it a bit with um, young people. So we are missing skilled young workers, people also from leadership level. And why should they be motivated to do this if the future is a bit kind of <clears throat> blurry so they don't really know what to expect? So really, we have to fight for people who want to still be in the forest and to manage forests. And this is something we should also take into account. And don't risk that attractivity with all these kind of, we listen to you, but we don't know where it goes to. Thank you. This question over the one comment, because we say that in our sector for 30 years, I hear this, we do not attract young talents. When I look around, we were all young talents once in our life. <laughs> and you hear the same thing from biotechnology, from, from all the other disciplines, exactly the same. So it's not forestry specific, even if we think so. There is a huge generation gap, as we know, we are the last boomers, so to say. And then that's it, so to say. So you will hear it from all of them. And this is very good what you say, but just to let you know, this is we do not have to get depressed. It's a global issue where the young ones and how do we get them involved? Question on the side, please. Okay, good morning. I'm Fernando Almau from uh, Medi21. We are a small environmental engineering company in Valencia. We generate uh, 15 jobs in our small... Uh, oh, no. It's, it's here. Sorry? No, no, please go ahead. Super. Okay. Uh, we are fixing rural population. Uh, we have been working on uh, European projects uh, since uh, five years ago, six years ago. The first one uh, was for 5.5 million euros. And with, with this project, uh, we executed a sensors network for, for, to monitoring the forest. We executed uh, silvicultural works in a natural park. We have made uh, the largest uh, forest fire prevention and defense installation in Europe. Uh, and the most advanced in the world uh, to protect with uh, green fire breaks and prescribed irrigation uh, with regenerated water um, from urban uh, areas to protect the natural park and uh, 15,000 inhabitants. 
We are now uh, on a horizon uh, of 18 million euros, both with uh, practical application, both uh, co-financed. Um, I mean, we are beneficiaries um, from the European uh, policies, but also disadvantaged by the European uh, functioning and bureaucracy. The first project has um, cost uh, us 400,000 euros, non-refundable. Uh, this project almost cost us um, uh, our life uh, because the financing was really hard uh, to us to put this money, uh, non-refundable to this money, okay? And uh, there is the question, because we, we, we support the, the audit took one year. Um, that's so hard for us. Uh, why are the financing rules the same for a large company or for a small company? Uh, this is a problem, uh, but as Marcus requested, a proposal. Uh, do you consider viable to adapt financing formulas to facilitate the participation of small companies like ours? Are we really a priority for the European Commission? And uh, for Helga, Franz and Nelson, uh, how do you think uh, that it's possible to connect the, the policy makers, the academic and research world uh, with the territory and with the small companies like, like ours? And finally, just a, a fact uh, um, regarding European aircrafts. Firefighting is uh, the answer that we, we take as a society, but it's not the solution. Uh, we need proactive actions, not reactive ones. And uh, these airplanes are a perfect example of the disconnection between real needs in the landscapes and the European response. Mm. That is super, please. Which order? Shall we start with Nelson now because Marcus is still taking notes? <laughs> <laughs> Sir, uh, Regarding the question of how to involve uh, smaller enterprises or um, private owners at local level, we are trying to create environments to create uh, workshops that we invite both scientists and these small uh, enterprises and these uh, local level uh, private owners to ask them what are their problems, what do they need. Because we, if we don't know what these problems are, we can just come up with uh, scientific answers, but they will not reflect the reality. So the first step is to invite them to, for them to tell us what are their problems. And then, scientifically, we can find a solution or, or, or at least uh, we can address the problem in a way that we can find a, a, a better explanation for it and we can try to come up with responses. Then those responses, we can take them either ourselves or we can support the, the uh, small um, enterprises to bring them to the policy makers. This would be the third step. But first of all, we need to understand the problem so we can work on it and then bring the solutions to whoever can do something about it. He asked all of us. So I will just continue. I mean, it's about resources as well. As we do it in Bavaria, I mean, the Bavarian State Forest Enterprise, we have a consultancy board, we have uh, research, and, and the research is included in that, so there's a good exchange, but we also have a good exchange with the Bavarian Forest Owners Association. So we grouped ourselves together with the, the other associations just to, to share these expertise on this level, a regional level. But I think in Germany there's a huge difference in between the handle because um, the Bavarian Private Forest Owners Associations are quite strong in Bavaria, I think. It's um, not so much in other parts of Germany, so it depends really locally how you can connect and, and then react also up to another level. Well, I can only say we are a research organization, international organization. We are also, in, uh, of course, involved in Horizon projects. Uh, at the moment, I think we lead uh, six, no, seven Horizon projects. Uh, one leader is uh, Magdes in the room. She leads the superb project uh, for, on forest resilience. 
Uh, and there, uh, in this project, we have, of course, uh, also partners like this um, SEO organizations to actually implement things on the ground as well, or test how it's implemented on the ground. So we are already cooperating, and um, I could, of course, also talk about the Bioregions facility that is happily also funded by the Bas government, uh, and I would like to th say thank you for this. Uh, in the Bioregions facility, we also connect uh, science and um, also industrial, um, uh, like new innovations, uh, and we try to bring them together with policymakers. Uh, so we do a lot of things here already. Before, Markus, before you answer all three quickly, how can you support the role of SMEs and make their life easier? Do you have an answer to that? Because that, this is the most crucial question for our sector. I am SME. I was before in research institute. My life has changed tremendously. <laughs> tremendously. And I agree there are some really obstacles which are ridiculous, where I say, come on, this is absolutely ridiculous, but you have to stick to it. Think about it, we listen to Markus, three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I will be shorter, so thank, thanks, thanks a lot, sir. sir. So the financing that you mentioned uh, were related to the cup, or I don't know, because I, honestly, I don't have an answer for you, but I, I take it. Okay. 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 Thanks a lot. So it was perhaps uh, I'm a bit slow. Slow. Uh, so, so yeah. So the, on the simplification on the audit, I agree with you, but I don't have the competence and uh, I, the authority to, to say anything. But uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, within the cup, that's what we are list. Uh, we had now on the standing force the committee that the countries could uh, comment on the forest-related measures, sh what should be improved, and I think the opinion is going to be uh, soon soon approved, so that's what I can say and contribute to you. And then I, I, what I really would like after this day is also that everybody gets my message, and my message is that process is not something that is up there. Process is also you, and there's many ways of influencing. So it's the, the this stakeholder platform on forests and forestry, where you can you can ask for the meetings, but it's also it's also your government, and uh, it is that the council, it is your your MEPs, and if you have a good connection to your MEPs, go to talk to them because it's then and then they they press the button. So that's that's it. And uh, I mean, I'm I'm just a one representative of ma how many thousands of people, and I understand the sector a bit. So f for me, it's like carrying your message. I really understand, and I take good notes. And for me. Etc. So don't don't worry. Yeah? But it's it's carrying water to the sea because I understand you. But it's 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 those people that do not understand you. And there are so many. And with their own history, with the, they want to go home at uh, eight o'clock in the evening. The, the, the kids are screaming. So there's also a lot of other things influencing this. It's it's not some some imaginary thing. So that's uh, if 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 my message can be like this: that go and influence. Then I think I'm I'm more more than more than, than than happy. This is what we start today to influence, Bruno. Please. Bien. Bon, bonjour à tout le monde. Je vais m'exprimer en français. Je suis le président de l'UC, mais c'est à titre de des forestiers de la Nouvelle-Aquitaine en France, qui est la première région forestière que je vais m'exprimer. Également, le président de la protection des forêts en Nouvelle-Aquitaine. J'ai deux, j'ai une remarque et une question. La première question, la première remarque, c'est que chaque fois qu'on nous parle de incendie de forêt, on nous parle de matériel. Ça a été dit par plusieurs interlocuteurs ce matin. On nous parle de suite de la lutte. Et lorsqu'on parle de prévention, on nous dit de planter d'autres arbres ou on nous dit de planter, de faire attention à la végétation qui est dessous. Mais qui met le feu? Ce n'est pas les arbres qui sont en flamme. C'est parce qu'il y a toujours une cause. Et c'est parce qu'il faut chercher ces causes et empêcher ces causes qu'il faut développer la prévention. Ça vous coûtera beaucoup moins cher aux États et à l'Europe que d'acheter du matériel. Ça, c'est ma première remarque. Les mots ont une importance. La deuxième remarque, ça a été évoqué quand on parle des jeunes. Nos États et vous, et c'est pour ça que je le dis, Nous devons défendre la propriété forestière. 
ça a été dit tout à l'heure, ces milliers de propriétaires, si eux n'investissent pas dans leur forêt, s'ils ne l'entretiennent pas, toutes ces forêts d'Europe, les laisserons-nous aux écologistes qui, eux, ne paient rien Ils ne donnent pas un centime et ils nous donnent des conseils en permanence. Ils influent sur nos gouvernements, et ils influent sur l'Europe pour nous empêcher de faire notre travail qui, jusqu'à présent, a été bien fait puisque les gens veulent s'y promener et que les écologistes veulent se sauvegarder. C'est tout ce que j'ai à vous dire. Aidez-nous. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Some remarks or answers, please, if you feel. Yeah. Hi, good morning. Thank you for the invitation and congratulations to you uh, by this organization. And I, uh, I'd like to, to make a remark and a, a kind of suggestion. Uh, uh, the remark is, when we talk about uh, uh, natural parks, national parks, uh, reserves, for instance, in Portugal, we are talking about private forest. And this is a tremendous challenge for managing and for uh, 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 give incentives to forest owners to manage actively because the, 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 the forest becomes a passive instead of a active. Okay, and that is, is, is important to take into account when we are talking about the, the, the challenge of uh, uh, biodiversity or conservation. And a su suggestion is, uh, uh, we talk about a lot of research in Europe, but I, and the innovation, and I think the lines that are uh, 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 in place are insufficient because they are led only by researchers or institutions by researchers. And I think we should have, uh, of course, with the same researchers that are good and good organizations, but we, we should have a budget and a program uh, that could be led by forest owners to put in place their goals and their preoccupations, their challenges. And uh, I, I think the Horizon 2020 is not a good tool for us because we participate in uh, plenty of projects uh, as a stakeholders, as a, I, I don't know, I, 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 I give uh, uh, dozens of support letters to projects because I find it all interesting. But then the, the, the transfer, the knowledge transfer, uh, and I think we, we should have uh, 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 organizations that are specialized in knowledge transfer. Not even researchers or forest organizations have the skills to treat uh, and to transfer the knowledge that we have in, uh, across Europe. And uh, to give a positive uh, 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 remark, I think operational groups are a good tool and we need to uh, 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 um, uh, reinforce that line of, of researchers, but the member states have, have to, 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 to be aware that innovation is not only technology. And that's my suggestion to the European Commission. Thank you. Perfect. And if you allow me, because I'm to blame for some of the things if you want to, I'm behind all the programming since Framework Program 5 until today and all the, the transnational programs for the forest-based sector. It's a good comment and please let me explain probably that helps a little bit to understand the Horizon Europe program today and the previous programs like uh, Horizon 2020, Framework Program 7, Framework Program 6 and so on. You should try to understand it in the development of the European Union. We had this enlargement 2004, 2005, uh, we have accession countries. A European funded project lasts usually the preparation and the whole project five to six years before it's ending. And the, the nature of the project is that the results, the knowledge that will be generated or produced should actually base the ground for Im being implemented after eight to ten years. It's to create a European collaboration. See, this is why you as a stakeholder, as some are frustrated, like, huh? 
I'm here, I signed the letters, and it sounds interesting, but when can I use it? And that's, you feel totally right, that's what I want to say. But if you understand those projects that are funded 100% by the Commission services, it's an instrument for the policies which have this long-term perspective. So, but you're privileged to be there and don't underestimate your role. Even if you think I cannot use it right now, you're hurt and this will be seen then in five to 10 years time. And you can see many of those results perfectly. So a little bit to please you, you feel totally right. You have a good understanding that your role does not feel at ease with your daily work, but it's still important. And then when we come down to the national regional level, those projects that are funded on those levels should help you in your daily life, right? There you get those which really can say, okay, this is not working, I need an investment or infrastructure or regrouping, economic grouping. This is very important. Last but not least, thank you so much that I can even make this statement now, operational groups. And here is also one, we talk about the gap European level and down on the ground. There is, today it has changed the name, but you know, formerly there was this European Innovation Partnerships under agriculture and uh, um, raw materials. I coordinated in 2018 an expert group for the sustainable mobilization of forest biomass. And we came with the, up with the report. And the report is 100% for private forest owners all around Europe to create operational groups and local conditions, I would not even say here regional conditions, really like local conditions, to get funding and to say we have a problem here or a need here. So my question is, whom of you has seen the report? Yes, you have seen <laughs> You. And that's, I, I feel hurt because I think this was, our work was actually for you there's something missing that it didn't get from Brussels to you. It was a report for you in Portugal, in France, in Finland, wherever we are, Sweden, to go to your local authorities and say, we need new, and that's up to you what you need and what you want to do, and you get funded for that. It's a good example. So it's, it's once again something where we say, okay, there is money, there's an opportunity, but why didn't you get it? There's something we have to improve that you get these things in your hands. Sorry, please. Oh, yeah. Uh, Karina Christiansen representing EREAF, uh, Regional Forest Network, and Northern Sweden also. Uh, just a short comment on uh, the word bioeconomy, and then I have a question for Marcus. Um, uh, yeah, like we have uh, tried in Sweden for about uh, at least 10 years to introduce the terminal term bioeconomy actually failed, uh, not even in forest circles. Uh, so from a communication perspective, which is also my background, we started to say bio-based economy or bio-based society, which seemed to float in wider circles. And it also works in the political context. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and the question for Marcus is, um, uh, I, first of all, I agree with Marcus that I have a very positive outlook on that you actually can make change in Brussels if you're focused and you just work on it. Uh, I, I've seen that uh, in two years. And I also think that um, there has been a ba major change uh, the last two years in the in the sort of Brussels bubble in regards of forestry. So my question to Marcus, because it's like uh, uh, criminology, kind of uh, trying to figure out things from a distance outside of the European Commission. But uh, uh, like the Lulu CF had a strong belief in uh, coal sink in the standing forest. And that was also a base in the first uh, draft of the carbon removal legislation. That was like a major thing. And we objected to that heavily, like many others. And we had the most stable in buildings because of, you know, the fire risk and the insects and everything. So, so that is heavily changed in the actual now proposal for the carbon removal. It's like a huge change from the original text. Uh, to the better, and and also in the original text, it was also, also the terminology 
uh, uh, EU's for, uh, forest, like the forest belong to the union, but they, they don't because they have owners, right? So, and the, in the actual now pro current proposal, it's a union forest, which is more correct. So, uh, do you think, uh, like, there is, is there, have you noticed, like, a change in, in the belief in, in uh, carbon st sinks in, like, standing old forest? Thank, thanks, thanks a lot. <laughs> Poor Markus. Eh? No, no, it's okay. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I will enjoy the lunch. Uh, no, <laughs> but I have to say, I, I was not involved in the Lulu Safe discussion, so I don't know if there has been a change in the in the in the discussion or in the line or in the in the, the storyline, but. Uh, to, to calm a bit down is that, uh, and I think your example is a good example, is the EU forests. I think quite often it is, uh, it is not on purpose, it's a, it's a misspelling. Mm. And uh, also to, to bring you down is that, uh, not, not to bring you down, but uh, to bring everybody on the ground is that uh, uh, when a document is uh, created, it's uh, proposed by, by a service, there's an inter-service consultation where all the other DGs concerning the issues uh, are, have time to comment the document. And the time to comment is sometimes ridiculous short. And uh, so, and then of course, everybody tries to bring in their text and so on. And I think quite often it is just a spelling mistake. And there it is very important that the, the, the stakeholders, the member states say, and I've been also in the discussions where, where the, uh, member state says, hey, oh, sorry, Commission, but you don't own any forest. So that, that's that's okay. But I think uh, then uh, coming back to the LULUCEF and the car carbon, uh, I think what the Commission now also realizes is that uh, it is about uh, carbon storing, of course, in long, long term uh, products, uh, but it is also technical storage of carbon. But then also, we do not forget also the short 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 term storage of, of carbon. So I think that there's there is perhaps a shift in the in the in the in the the, the storyline. But as I said, I was not involved so I don't dare to give any because I d I don't know. Yeah. But to to really bring it to, to the ground is like yeah sometimes it's just a misspelling because uh, kids are screaming and you have to go home and then it's like because I mean those documents they're, they're huge an impact assessment can be 300 pages mm. and if you only have uh, four days to comment on it then uh, congratulations to everybody because it's only the impact assessment and you try to to fix many things in the impact assessment but you have to in the end that you have to be very pragmatic and you have to say okay I can only fight the battles that are very important so that that's so quite often it's, it's also human. Thanks a lot. And then some of your colleagues do not have your fantastic forestry background. And then if they have to work on that, then of many, course... Many have, many have, many yeah, have. Many have. Lea and then Bill. Yeah, I'm sorry, Marcus, but I think you have to still be talking for a little while. <laughs> but no, because, uh, well, uh, from user's point of view, you know that our main task is kind of, uh, okay, support all our members in the different regions, but then do the lobbying as we can, as much as we can at level Brussels, uh, at Brussels level. And you know that uh, we are not in the same position as forest, uh, Brussels-based organizations, so... And nevertheless, we have a really close uh, relation with our members, with our forest owners. Actually, I'm a forest owner, so I mean, we do we do know real we, really well what the land is, what our land is, what our souls are, and what our forests are. Uh, we have been hearing a lot about dialogue, building a dialogue, talking to each other, and all that. I, I have to say, and I think Edurne will agree with me, we have been trying to talk, and I have to say that the, we, are, we have been always very well received by the European, European Commission. We have really good personal relations with everybody, but I think we talk, but we don't listen to each other. And you said you should bring uh, data, you should bring good arguments and all that. We do. But then when we see the proposals come into uh, legislation or whatever, we don't see any of that anywhere. We have seen that some of the proposals have been based in some studies that we have been told by the European Commission. We have seen that other studies that are from our Southern Europe uh, area weren't 
taken into account, for example, for X, I'm not going to say which proposals are what, I mean, they weren't taken into account and they were really important. They should have been taken into account. So we saw that, yeah, European Commission, I don't know, they listen to, I guess, whoever they think they have to listen, but sometimes they should be an effort as well, not only for us to go there, but to try to contact people from the different uh, regions to see what the expertise tells them. Because, you know, we have a lot of expertise, as, as Rosario, our member from Portugal, said. Uh, and we need to, yeah, we bring back best practices, we bring bad practices, but not what doesn't work, we do bring there. Actually, in different roundtables, we have been saying for a thousand times that we have very little lands. We have heard that the average is in Portugal three hectares. Here we are between two, five. I've been saying, okay, for example, with the Closer to Nature guidelines, I'm a forest owner, I have three hectares, for example. You want me to leave dead wood in a percentage X. We have to leave this without planting. We have to put biodiversity for biodiversity, another terrain, and then we have a little small piece where we have to put diversity of species. What is a forest owner going to do? Run, escape, leave, abandon. Is that what we want? And, you know, and this event, it's not only for saying, oh, look, and the video we put, it's not just a nice video for saying, oh, people will start with some amusement here. No, every single second of the video was well thought to transfer to European Commission, to experts in Europe, to all people, about what do we have here, and the same as we have here, they have all, all the different diverse forests in other parts of Europe, and we need to take them into account when we legislate and all that. So I like to be constructive and optimistic, I will continue trying to, but uh, I think that the same, uh, in the same way we go to Brussels, the European Commission shouldn't always say, oh, we are very busy to go two days to your region. Because maybe we need to go these days for an event like that and then for a visit and see the real thing instead of having to put a video where we do try to do our best. But I think we need people from the European Commission to come to the land and talk to our forest owners. And I think that's where the gap between ambition and implementation would work much better. Sorry for the but long... He's here, like so that. thank you that you're here. You came. Yeah. So you want to... Yeah, by, by the way, I was going to thank Marcus because he, he has very gently accepted to come here. So, so yeah, yeah, it was come? not against you. It's the opposite, no, actually. No, no, I, I she really, declared I really pure love, already. yes. Bill, <laughs> no, 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 no. question or comment. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a comment and picking up on what was said by our Portuguese colleague about operational groups. I've been involved for 20 odd years in the European Network for Rural Development. And I've seen a change and a really significant change take place. Let me just say that this morning what I've heard is about a mismatch, a mismatch between administration and regulation and practice, and a mismatch between research and practice. And as I've watched the observation of the European Innovation Partnership, AGRI, uh, evolve into these operational groups. What I've seen is something that's very close to what happened in Australia about 30 years ago with so-called land care groups. Basically, farmers and landowners felt <coughs> alienated from government and policy and decided to go for a bottom-up approach to addressing environmental problems. Those ideas were actually picked up and developed, particularly in Wageningen, by Niels Rohling and others. And he came up with a model of participatory learning and action research. And we've seen the evolution of the idea of an ACIS, an agricultural knowledge and information system, which is now supported in these operational groups, which is localized and recognizing specific problems in specific places and asking for collaborative learning by land managers, linking to <coughs> researchers who they choose. And that seems to me to be an eminently sensible model that would help you in Spain, it would help anywhere Portugal and elsewhere, and you've talked about it already. And 
It's almost as though foresters sometimes need to look out of the forest, into the fields, at what the farm sector is doing, learn some of the lessons that they have learned over the last 30 years. Because it, I've been involved in plenty of Horizon projects and before that, uh, what went before. And they are disconnected too often from practitioners. Yeah, but that's what I said, because they and are the political instruments. Yeah, yeah, but you can still effectively involve SME yes. partners, yes. but you do have problems with the rules that were mentioned mm. by I fully my agree. Spanish colleague here. But I do think we can learn from those, you know, from those operational groups, use those as a bridgehead to get local groups active and responsive, and I think it will improve things. And Bill, that's exactly the right point, because the Commission has invented the partnerships for these operational groups because of the problem with the Horizon projects. So it's there, I fully support. Please, there's another question or comment. Thank you. The last one. Um, Anna, Anna Noriega, um, the uh, CEO of PFC in Spain, and I used to work in the forest, international forest policy arena for the Ministry of, of Environment. And then I was involved, uh, and Marcus mentioned, in the criterion indicators, uh, drafting and so on, working in the Vienna indicators in, at that time. So, yeah, doing, doing a lot of work together with all the sector, with the ENGOs, with, uh, then we draft that. Then sometime after, afterwards, uh, someone from PFC, the, pre the, the president of PFC, Spain, said, hey, I need someone like you to implement this. For me, it was a challenge, implementing what we have draft and implementing those criteria indicators in a bottom, as you mentioned, bottom-up approach, because this was created by the, the, for the stoners in, in Europe. Um, and then it, it was wonderful. It was beautiful. It was something great. Uh, but you realize, as, as it, 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 uh, time is passing by, that um, not always is taking into account this big, big effort of, first, the forest owners. We have to organize. We, it has been organized at, at, the, uh, at a manner that anyone with half a hectare or less uh, surface uh, owned, um, land owned is, uh, can, can be on board. So we, it, there is a big effort. Not, not from the organizations ourselves, PFC, no, it's from, from the person, also from the governments. This in Spain, we are an association of, uh, for, the, for forest uh, uh, sustainability. This is how we are, our, let's say, um, uh, 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 the institution is an association uh, in, at, the, at the national level. And we have together, uh, we have a, a corresponsibility because we have inside the uh, regional governments, 10 regional governments up, uh, out of uh, 17, they are there talking with the private owners, talking together, sitting at the same table and trying to find out what are the best ways to, to speak about sustainability. But we come to the commission and then, and then we, we, we listen and they, they just look at us like, yeah, you are doing it, but who cares? And then I'm going to do something about certification by myself. Who will be the third party that will, will uh, validate what is going on if the Commission is taking this role in the future? Who is going to validate? There is a big, big uh, network of auditors. I mean, there is a big work in, during the last 25 years in fr coming bottom up again. Mm. It seems not to be, into, uh, they, they, uh, be taken into account. I really Thank love you. that you tell the reality of the challenges. This is so important today. Thank you. Last question or comment, please. Eh, buenos días. Eh, después en la siguiente mesa redonda participo. Soy el director general de, de Montes de, de Galicia. Y bueno, he dejado hablar porque aparte... Eh, Los propietarios hoy han tenido aquí una parte activa y creo que ha sido muy interesante todo su planteamiento y casi a modo de, de reflexión porque la Galicia es una comunidad que tiene 1.400.000 hectáreas arboladas, tenemos el 98% de propiedad privada y cortamos del orden de 10-11 millones de metros cúbicos al año. Eh, y al respecto de lo que se ha estado diciendo y que coincido plenamente con los propietarios, no puede ser de otra manera, teniendo esa propiedad en, en Galicia, yo es que a veces, y, y si tal después en la siguiente mesa redonda lo, lo trataré de aclarar, 
Es que a veces yo entiendo que, que cuando se realizan estos marcos normativos desde, desde la Unión Europea, se está enfocando a la propiedad y a la gestión forestal y a los propietarios como parte de un problema. Y yo creo que había que enfocarlos como parte de la solución. Es que ellos tienen que ser la parte y tienen que solucionarnos los problemas de los suministros de materia prima. Nos tienen que garantizar la conservación de la biodiversidad y nos tienen que garantizar la fijación de carbono, la descarbonización esa de la sociedad europea que queremos hablar. Y hay que darle ese enfoque, hay que sentarse con ellos y ver si no están las cosas haciéndose del todo bien, cómo se pueden ir mejorando. Pero creo que ese enfoque tiene que ser el adecuado. La propiedad forestal y la gestión forestal en Europa ha demostrado durante estos últimos años que se ha aumentado la superficie arbolada, que hay zonas protegidas y que se garantiza la biodiversidad y, se, y tenemos problemas, claro. Hay unos problemas de cambio climático, de temas fitosanitarios, de incendios. Pero el principal problema que tienen la propiedad es que se abandona. Y créanme, nosotros somos conscientes, tenemos una generación o dos como mucho para tratar de vincular de nuevo a la, los propietarios a la propiedad y por tanto a la gestión forestal. Y, y yo lo tengo claro, y ya concluyo, los propietarios y la, y, y la gestión forestal es una buena parte de la solución que está planteando Europa para tener en cuenta esos desarrollos normativos y no son parte del problema. Nada más. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Super. So, hello. Thank you so much for your open discussion. And if you allow me, please, we all stand up to applaud our panelists who really did a great job. And then we go with them for the lunch break and enjoy the lunch. And uh, I will call you back in any way sooner or later. So please stand up. We applaud for our panelists. Very special thanks to you for being here. Great insight and uh, bon appétit.